Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 130, which reads as follows. Sambeta santi dandasa sambe sang jivitang piyang atanang upamangkatwa nahaneya naghataye which uh, which is almost the same as the last one. It means all tremble at the rod. But this is what is different is Jivitang Piyang, life is dear, sabesang to all. Life is dear to all. And then the same as the last one, Atanang Upamangkatwa, having made a comparison with oneself, Naaneya Naghataye. And the story actually is said to be almost the same as the last one. The Buddha laid down two rules. And so in the last uh, story, it's about how he laid down the rule against hitting other monks. The group of six monks who were infamous for their escapades, breaking in a lot of rules and being the uh, instigation for establishing many rules. They uh, they hit the hit a group of seventeen monks who had taken up residence. So this one doesn't say what actually happened, but for some reason or other they were angry at these Satarasa Wagi Bhikkhu, the seven, group of seventeen monks. And uh, but in this case, it's interesting. The English translation I think gets it wrong. It said the English translation says they hit them. And then this group of 17 monks held up their fist in response to scare them away. But I don't think that's what the Pali actually says. I can't quite get the get it for sure, but it certainly doesn't make it clear that it was in response. It appears to say that just like in the last one, where they actually hit the group of 17, in this one the group of six monks just held up their fists to scare, to, to scare them. And again the monks screamed. And again the Buddha heard and asked, what's that scream all about? And someone told him. And he said, Na bhikkhuve ito pataya bhikkhuna e nama evangatabang. From here on, monks, this is not to be done by monks. Whoever does it has broken a rule. And then he explains it, he says, Bhikkhuna nama yathahang tateva anyepi dandasa tasanti Just as, as I, so others, tremble at the rod. Yatha chamai hang tateva ne sang jivitang piyang Just as to me, and just as to me, so to others life is dear. Knowing this, nyatva evang nyatva, knowing this, or iti nyatva, paro na parhitabo na tabo. Knowing this, one should not strike or kill another. And so this is sort of the, as I already said, this is sort of the uh, Buddhist version of the Golden Rule about doing unto others as they would do unto you. But there's two interesting um, points that I can talk about for this one. Um, the first is that they haven't actually done anything. You know, They didn't actually harm the other monks. And uh, so often we place uh, a lot of emphasis on the action, you know, when, when you actually harm someone. And I mean, it's not it's not any deep or, or uh, esoteric teaching, but it's it's interesting to remind ourselves that it's not actually it's not actually the acts itself. It's our own uh, viciousness in the mind when you raise your hand against someone, even just raising your hand. 
you know, a lot of abuse is, uh, is not even physical. It's emotional. It's the fear. And uh, oftentimes it's the, the fear itself that is more harmful. That the actual bruises, the actual scars um, heal much easier much more completely than the, the, the mental scars. You know, you hear stories about parents who tell their kids to go get them their belt, right? Go get me my belt. Could you imagine having, knowing, like when you know what, what, what the meaning is, you know, you have to actually go and bring them the weapon they're going to use against you. And trauma. So uh, that's one thing is re remembering, especially in, for meditation purposes, you know, remembering to focus on our mind states, our, our intentions. It doesn't matter whether you actually kill or harm someone. It's the viciousness, the cruelty, the lack of compassion, the, uh, the um, slavery to anger, you know getting lost in our own anger so we can't even see what we're doing. And that's the second thing to point out is um, that it, it, this isn't just an intellectual exercise where we say, yes, I don't want to be harmed and, and therefore it makes sense that I shouldn't harm others. It's not like that. It's The very fact that you don't want to be harmed yourself makes it uh, perverse for you to harm others. And that's what makes it uh, or that's one way of explaining what makes it karmically active. You know? That when you harm others, it comes back to harm you and you subject yourself to harm. Because you know in your mind that this is wrong. You, 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 there's a sense that this is uh, an evil thing. And, and by evil, I just mean something you wouldn't want to happen to you. And because you know that, uh, when you do it to others, it uh, it leaves a scar on 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 your mind. It uh, it perverts your, your your very reality, you know. Because doing things that you want to happen to you is easy because there's a sense of the goodness of them. You know, this is a good thing to do. So you do it for someone else. Why? Because it's a good thing. Oh. You don't have to feel the other person's happiness. You know that this is something that leads to happiness. So when you do it for them, it makes sense. To do something that causes harm to someone else actually is perverse because you know the harm in it. You know that this is an evil thing. And by evil, again, this is a suffering thing, a thing that leads to suffering. So anyone who says that uh, you should try and maximize your own happiness even at the expense of others, or who argues that um, you know, anyone who says look out for yourself first is being selfish because then they go and harm others, doesn't really understand how it works. You can't be selfish and work for your own benefit. Anyone who is selfish is not working for their own benefit um, because they're doing things that they know are wrong. And again, wrong simply means things that lead to suffering. It's wrong because it leads to suffering and there's no um, there's no distinction that can be made between the suffering for oneself or the suffering for another because in your mind there's an awareness, there's an understanding that this is a cause for suffering. There is, uh, there is that. So it, it, it necess necessarily involves anger, it involves unwholesome mind state. And, uh, and leads you to be susceptible to harm yourself. When you harm others, it, I mean, the, the practical fallout is that you'll be afraid and um, you, you'll, be, you'll put yourself in a situation where you know, you're paranoid about retribution. When you die, it will be an obsession in your mind. It's the kind of thing that comes back to haunt you when you harm the harm you've done to others. 
And so when you die, you, you end up with that as part of your rebirth, with that as part of who you are, potentially leading you to hell even, but, but more likely just to lead, lead you to a situation, an abusive situation. You know, often this is what leads to these cycles of, of retribution where um, one person is, is, one person harms another, then they're both reborn and the other person, you know, one person is the aggressor, the other is the victim, and, and it, it cycles like that. This kind of thing can happen because of the psychology of it. You harm others and you pervert your own situation. There's a, there's a sense that that is how karma works. And so, the kind of thing that we uh, look into, that we uh, discover through our practice, how, how these things affect our mind. And so it's not just a pretty saying, yes, don't harm others because you wouldn't want that to happen to you. There actually is some depth to it. That in fact that's uh, very much a, an intrinsic part of how the mind works. So, anyway, not too much to talk about because it's very similar, but we're continuing on. We've started the tenth chapter. This is verse number two. So we're on next to number 131. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all.